On October 16, 1859, John Brown attempted to lead an armed slave revolt by capturing the United States arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia. After his capture, he was charged with murder, treason, and conspiring with slaves to rebel and was sentenced to hang. Among the soldiers sent to Charlestown for Brown's hanging was 18-year-old William Pegram, whose family roots were in the countryside west of Petersburg, Virginia. Upon his return, Pegram wrote nothing of witnessing John Brown's death, but for the effect it had in the state capital, he noted, before the Harper's Ferry outbreak, this regiment could not muster over 350 men. Now we have about 750. Brown foretold the fate of the nation in writing on the day of its execution, the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. With the opening shots on Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861, the nation quickly divided and Pegram enlisted in an artillery battery within days. As a surgeon stationed in Fort Sumter, Captain Samuel Crawford, Jr. was on the receiving end of those opening shots on April 12th. A native Pennsylvanian, Crawford joined the United States Army after graduating from medical school. By New Year's Day, 1861, Crawford and the rest of the Union troops were holed up inside the fort. From here, he wrote to his family, I never felt, I never knew how much I love my country until now. When the tiny garrison was forced to capitulate on Sunday, April 14th, he was the last Union officer to leave Fort Sumter. Four years later, these two men, Pegram and Crawford, found themselves at Five Forks, a crossroads that had become the linchpin of the Confederate capital. For Crawford, Union victory here would begin the restoration of honor to the flag that he saw removed from Fort Sumter. For Pegram, the Confederate victory meant the continuation of God's will. When General Ulysses S. Grant took command of federal forces in the spring of 1864, one of his main objectives was to destroy General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. The armies fought their way southward through Virginia for six weeks, ending at Cole Harbor, just east of the Confederate capital of Richmond. Having failed to capture Richmond, Grant shifted his troops southward to Petersburg, the terminus of rail lines that linked Richmond to the rest of the South and the world. When Grant launched his initial attack on Petersburg in mid-June 1864, the city did not fall, and soon it and the surrounding countryside became a battleground for the next nine and a half months. By spring of 1865, the Confederates were stretched almost to the breaking point and suffered the loss of all but one remaining lifeline from the West, the Southside Railroad. With the arrival of spring and General Philip Sheridan's triumphant cavalry from the Shenandoah Valley, Grant launched an offensive to break the stalemate at Petersburg. He ordered Sheridan to break the Southside Railroad. In response to this threat, Lee ordered one of his largest infantry divisions, under General George Pickett, and most of the Southern Cavalry to stop Sheridan. By nightfall of March 31st, Pickett had stopped the Union drive at Dinwiddie Courthouse, but when Sheridan received reinforcements, the Confederates withdrew north to the Five Forks intersection. Lee sent Pickett the following order. Hold Five Forks at all hazards, protect road to Ford's Depot, and prevent Union forces from striking the Southside Railroad. Day of Evil Omen, All Fool's Day, Captain Henry Chambers of the 49th North Carolina, April 1, 1865. For more than two hours on the afternoon of April 1, 1865, 30,000 men fought for control of this crossroads control of the last railroad out of Petersburg, and the control of Richmond. Colonel William Pegram was in the center of the line with a portion of the artillery he commanded. Thought to be the best gunner in Lee's army, he had fought in numerous battles without being wounded. What do I have to fear Yankee bullets and shells as long as I am under God's protection, William once wrote his concerned mother. 
though deeply hurt by the death of his brother John months earlier, and in spite of the setbacks the Confederates had recently suffered, Pegram still believed the South's way of life was ordained by God. To Pegram, to abandon the Confederacy was the same as abandoning God and family. On the day of the battle, Pegram's adjutant, William McKay, wrote, Never shall I forget the sweet serenity of his face as he rode erect to the very front of the line. Sheridan had more than 20,000 men to break the southern position at Five Forks. Among them was General Crawford, who had become an infantry officer after Sumter and now commanded a division. Pickett had arrayed his 10,000 men east to west through the intersection with their backs to the all-important railroad. Sheridan went to the gravelly-run Methodist Episcopal Church just east of the Five Forks intersection to confer his plan to the infantry, led by General Governor Warren. A witness described the meeting. Sheridan took a saber or scabbard and described it graphically on the light earth. The plan in general was for the cavalry to occupy the enemy's attention by a brisk demonstration along the right front of their works, while the Fifth Corps should fall upon their left and rear, by a sort of surprise if possible and scoop them out of their works along the White Oak Road and capture or disorganize them. Just after four o'clock in the afternoon, while the Union infantry moved forward and engaged the Confederates on the eastern end of the line, the dismounted Union cavalry, with their seven-shot repeating Spencer carbines, did their job keeping the gray line pinned down. However, Crawford's infantry did not find the gray line where they expected and veered off to the west in search of the foe. As Warren went to find and redirect Crawford, Sheridan personally led the attack against the entrenched southerners on the east end of their line. Captain Chambers of the 49th North Carolina Infantry wrote about the action. A regular stampede now commenced. The enemy was pressing on all sides. The men were confused and various commands mixed with each other. There was no concert of action. There was no one who could control the confused mass of men. The contagion spread as this made its way up the line. The cowardly ran. The timid were dumbfounded. The brave alone could not withstand the vastly superior force of the enemy. The Confederates also suffered a lack of leadership, as General Pickett, having gone to the rear two hours earlier for a shad lunch, left without appointing anyone to command in his absence. On the east flank, the Federals took up Confederate prisoners and pushed the southern line back toward the Five Forks intersection. Crawford's men found themselves behind the Gray Line and turned to the west to engage the enemy. In response, southern troops had to be pulled from the front line to face this new threat from the rear. Seeing this unfold, Pickett, who had not heard the din of battle until this point, raced from his luncheon to the front. As the frontal assault of the dismounted cavalry raged along White Oak Road, Major Lumen Tenney of the 2nd Ohio Cavalry painfully watched the final minutes of his younger brother. Advanced through the pines until in sight of works and guns, repulsed, form line again, charged again, got under the works and laid down. Here, Brother Teddy, noble and brave boy, was struck through with a piece of shell helped him from the field, suffered awfully. In answer to my question, he said, Lumen, I think my wound is mortal. I cannot live. I've tried to do my duty today. Tell mother I only wish I had been a better boy. I hope that God will accept me and take me to heaven. He had his senses for 30 or 40 minutes when he sank away as we carried him along and died before we reached the hospital. With Custer's men attacking from the west, Union infantry advancing from the east and north, and Union cavalry to the south, the Confederate soldiers were forced from the vital intersection. The mounted Confederate cavalry on the west end of the line made a final stand, allowing the retreating Confederate infantry to use an old farm lane to escape the Federals. As darkness fell, the Confederates made their way to the north and awaited another attack along the railroad before being ordered to retreat west. The battle, although only lasting about two hours, had been costly. The Federals had over 100 men killed on the field and more than 700 more wounded in the fight. 
Southern losses were never fully documented, but more than 2,000 men were captured and more than 500 were thought to be killed and wounded. I am perfectly resigned if it is God's will to take me, but it will be such a blow to them at home, was one of the last thoughts of the 23-year-old Pegram. Having witnessed the beginnings of the Civil War, Pegram gave his life at what was the collapse of the country he and his fellow soldiers so believed in. The changes that began with John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry were, after almost four years of war, quickly becoming the realities for the reconstruction of the nation. When Grant received the report of the federal victory, he ordered an attack on both Petersburg and Richmond. With his lines breaking the following morning, Lee sent President Jefferson Davis a message. I see no prospect of doing more than holding our position here until night. I am not certain I can do that. If I can, I shall withdraw tonight north of the Appomattox, and if possible, it would be better to withdraw the whole line tonight from James River. I advise that all preparations be made for leaving Richmond. With Grant's victory at the siege, the armies left the trenches of Petersburg and continued fighting until Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on April 9th. Among the victorious officers was General Crawford, but he was ordered to leave before the final southern flag was furled. Crawford traveled back to Charleston, South Carolina, where on Friday, April 14, 1865, four years to the day from when it was removed, the same flag of the United States of America was hoisted back over the battered walls of Fort Sumter. One of the speakers summed up the state of the nation that day, no more disunion, no more secession, and no more slavery.